Behold, I will now show you a miracle. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Miraculous. Now, besides the indisputable miracle that is a Reese's Cup itself, the fact that I'm sitting here in my basement in Atlanta eating chocolate ought to blow your mind right out of its head socket. Like, by all accounts, chocolate should not be available to me since the continental U.S. cannot grow cacao beans which make chocolate. And yet here I am munching on this chocolatey goodness. And how this miracle came to be as a result of agriculture as a global system, and I reckon we ought to talk about it. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. So how in the fresh heck is it possible that I have chocolate here in my house? Well, it's a story that involves the development of a global supply chain. And by definition, this refers to the global economic interconnectedness of most countries in the world that specializes in the growing and trading of agricultural commodities on the world market. Now, remember back to the video on 5.7 when we talked about commodity supply chains? Well, I know you do, but there we were mainly talking about how that supply chain worked within a single country. And the global supply chain works the same way from farmers to processors to distributors to retailers, but here it's, you know, global. And hey, if you want no guys to follow along with this video, in all my videos, then check that link in the description. Anyway, here's where the miracle of chocolate in my American belly provides a perfect example. With the exception of Hawaii, the climate of the United States is about as suitable for growing cacao beans, from which we get chocolate, as the top of my head is suitable for growing hair. No, these sweet bippies require a tropical climate to grow, and in such a place like the Ivory Coast in Africa, this stuff grows like mad. And so, once those farmers harvest those beans, they're sent to various processing plants throughout the world who grind them into powder, which can then be used to make chocolate. And from there, the chocolate is shipped all around the world, mostly to core countries like the United States and countries in the European Union. And there, the chocolate goods are placed on the shelves of retailers, and then a 44-year-old bald man sees them and thinks, mm, I gotta get me some of those. And thus, the cycle is completed, and behold, the grand miracle. And this is true not just for chocolate, but for many of the agricultural goods that we take for granted, like wheat and corn and soybeans and coffee and vanilla and bananas and strawberries and on and on and on. And the only reason why I have access to those goods is because of the complex global supply chain that moves agricultural goods throughout the world usually from periphery and semi-periphery countries to core countries. And all of that sounds real great and all, but it's created the conditions for what's known as commodity dependence, which refers to a condition in which a country's economy is largely dependent on the export of cash crop commodities. And just like a pack of Starbursts, which can be both good and bad, so too can commodity dependence be both good and bad. Now let me just give you an example, namely the vanilla industry. This is the island of Madagascar, a periphery country, which is responsible for growing and exporting nearly two-thirds of the world's vanilla. Depending on what expert you consult, the export of vanilla is responsible for about 10% of Madagascar's economy. So here's the good part. While demand for vanilla is high in core countries, Madagascar's economy will be relatively prosperous. But here comes the bad news. What happens if global preferences for vanilla change? Like what if the folks in the European Union no longer want vanilla ice cream and instead want chocolate ice cream? Or what if drought or severe weather caused Madagascar's vanilla crops to fail, as actually happened between 2016 and 2019? Well, in those cases, the very commodity on which a full tenth of their economy depends is gone which amounts to billions of dollars lost. And that would put an already impoverished population into dire straits. So countries which specialize in exporting cash crops in order to support their economy are always in a precarious situation. So, says you, why don't they just diversify their economy and export other things, like, you know, balance things out? Well, if only it were that simple. And if you want to know why, then let's revisit that rascally old tyrant known as imperialism. And since we've spent a good deal of time with him already in this course, let me just give you a brief reminder of his exploits. So from the 15th to the 20th century, Western states, European states in particular, got their power pants on and began creating empires throughout the world. And one of the chief reasons that they did so was to control places that were rich in raw materials that they could feed to their machines in the factories. And so once an imperialist power controlled a place and they figured out what kind of materials they wanted out of that land and the people, they essentially organized the colonial economy to focus solely on exporting those desired goods. Now, in the 20th century, many of these colonized peoples won their independence, but after having an economy so long focused on export commodities and cash crops sent to powerful Western nations, it wasn't easy to change change that organization. And so the dark side of commodity dependence is yet another holdover from the age of imperialism, which is what geographers now call neo-colonialism, which I'm going to tell you all about in Unit 7. Okay, now that we know the basics of how the global supply chain works, you need to know three factors that affect the efficiency of the supply chain. The first factor includes political relationships, and I'm going to give you two examples. First is the problem of food subsidies. So it's not unusual for governments in core countries to provide subsidies to farmers. This just means that the government pays them or reduces their taxes as an incentive to grow certain crops. That means that 
farmers who receive those subsidies can afford to keep prices low on their products. So in terms of the global market, farmers in developing countries where no subsidies are available can struggle to compete with the lower prices of developed countries. The second kind of political relationship that can affect the global supply chain is known as a trade war, as we saw in 2018 between the U.S. and China. At that point, President Donald Trump felt saucy about U.S. dependence on Chinese goods, and so he increased tariffs and other barriers to trade against China, and China went right ahead and did the same thing against the U.S. And as it turns out, that little spat disrupted the global supply chain and required some companies to shift their manufacturing locations elsewhere. And not only that, it led to U.S. farmers generating a surplus of agricultural products because China was no longer buying them, and you know, like, that's a problem. Okay, the second major reality affecting the global supply chain is the presence or absence of working infrastructure. So to participate in the global supply chain means that a country has to have the necessary infrastructure to transport goods to the market, things like roads and bridges and facilities and electricity, etc. However, some underdeveloped countries lack the money to improve roads and shoddy infrastructure, and so they suffer economically because they are excluded from the global supply chain of food, both in selling the food and in receiving it, leading to hunger and starvation. And then the third reality affecting the global supply chain includes the shifting patterns of world trade, and I'll show you two examples. First, semi-peripheral countries like India, for example, are growing economically and contributing more to the global trade of food. And while countries like the U.S. and Europe still hold the top positions as importers and exporters on the global market, countries like Brazil and China and India are growing and participating more in global trade. The result is that patterns of world trade are beginning to shift. And second, the rise of the fair trade movement has changed patterns of world trade as well. So as I already mentioned, commodity farmers in developing nations are typically paid very little for their labor, but the crops that they grow, like coffee for example, make a great deal of profit on the market. And if that doesn't sound fair to you, well, it's not. So to rectify that, the fair trade movement was developed to address this inequality. So any product labeled free trade costs a little bit more, but the farmers who produce it are paid a fair wage. And that extra money often goes towards improving their quality of life by investing in modern technology, like better cooking utensils or better school resources for their children or medical care, etc. And as demand for these products has increased, it has changed the pattern of world trade for millions of farmers who participate in the system. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 5 and click here to grab my AP Human Geography video note guides, which are going to help you get all the contents of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds quick, fast, and in a hurry. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.